back. Today we're talking about the Mongol empires. Uh, it's a bit longer of a lecture, but hopefully it won't be painful. I think it's a very interesting subject. So one thing that makes the Mongol Empire interesting is that it's the largest empire in history. That title doesn't go to the Romans. The Chinese was a relatively brief empire, but for a period in the 1200s uh, AD or CE, uh, Genghis Khan, you may have uh, you may have heard of Genghis Khan, same guy, right? um, ruled an empire that reached from the Pacific all the way to Eastern Europe, into India, into the Arabian Peninsula, uh, huge, huge empire. Um, they defeated the Chinese, right? Completely took over China. Uh, they conquered parts of the Byzantine Empire, the Islamic empires. Uh, they all lost territory to the Mongol armies. And Another impressive fact of the empire is that it didn't take centuries, right, to reach that extent, as, for example, Rome did. Uh, this happened in a matter of decades. It was a quick flash, right? A, around 70 years to all of a sudden become a large empire in history and then to begin the collapse. Uh, so it wasn't as long lasting as the Romans, or certainly not as the Byzantines, but nonetheless, right, very interesting. Uh, and prolific empire in its own right, and definitely worth uh, studying and understanding, especially if we were looking at the variety of empires and what makes certain empires work the way they do. Very, very different sort, huge and quick. Interesting to study and look into the reasons for why that could be. So we've all already conquered We've already encountered the people, right, that will uh, develop this huge Mongol Empire under another name, right, the Xiongnu. So you may recall that, right, when the Qin had unified all the kingdoms other under a single empire, and this is true, you know, later dynasties, they were never completely at peace because there was more or less constant battles and skirmishes with nomadic, right, horseback warriors of the steppe. Plains. Um, as early as the 400s AD, you'll encounter these sorts of people. Attila the Hun may be a familiar name to you. Uh, he conquered a large areas, even threatening Rome before finally turning back, right, before attempting to, to conquer Rome. Uh, but he was one of these people as well, uh, these horse riding nomads. So the territory of, of these tribes consisted of steppes, forests, tundra, um, sort of stretched as far north as Finland, right into Scandinavia, butted up against the Chinese in the south and the Roman Empire uh, in the in the west. So yeah, I should have said west. The east eastern bound would be uh, would be a uh, so no one rides horses like Nomad, and that gives them sort of automatic skill as a war. Horseback, that's the fastest, fastest technology we have at the time, right? And so an entire army made up of uh, these incredible riders would be a form formidable military force. Uh, and they frequently, right? So even though, you know, for the Chin, they, they didn't constitute sort of another kingdom that needed to be uh, conquered, um, they were nonetheless an, an important rival, right, that was constantly going on. And, and, and in part, their, their lack of like a central capital, right, or central authority almost makes them more difficult to do, right, because it's not like if you conquer one tribe, you've done away, right, they've surrendered and they become part of your territory. It's, it's not like that. It's a very fluid enemy and, and thus very difficult to deal with, right. Um, but it wasn't just war uh, that was the the mode of engagement, right, between the the people of the steppes and you know for example, the Chinese. Uh, there was also trade going on. Um, there were alliances made, right. Of course, those alliances were often easily broken, right. So you know a winning strategy for a, a Mongol tribe would be to uh, make 
right? Attack the Chinese, um, accept a settlement, right? Maybe do a little trading and then just break that deal whenever it's due to them, right? Because what they do, they're the, again, these Mongols do not have a settled like central city or capital that the Chinese can come attack in retaliation. They can simply move on. In fact, that's their lifestyle, right? So, yeah, they, it's it was a lucrative uh, way of life and a difficult one, right, for settled empires to deal with. And as I said, you know, a lot of trade, culture, technological innovation was passed, right, between uh, the nomadic peoples and the these empires. Much of Chinese having encountered, right, these uh, horseback warriors certainly would have adopted much of that uh, technique as well, their own armies and so on with any sort of technological innovation. But the Mongol lifestyle was uh, a, a herding, right? So they subsisted off of herd animals. They uh, were not agriculturalists, right? They did not plant crops cattle they had sheep and those the steppes right these plains and hill, hilly areas were, were good for grazing but the grass if you took your animals to a certain part and had them graze couldn't stay there all year the grass didn't grow back quickly enough and so they became nomadic so they would move right their herds from area to area and and they would graze in that and they would off the milk right and the meat um, of these animals for the most part so for herding horses were essential right they were also very useful for war and at a very young age uh, these models become expert riders and this becomes the tool of their imposing military force uh, you could right so obviously they could eat their animals they could use them for leather, for clothing, to build shelters. Um, they you could make an alcoholic drink from fermented milk. Uh, and even famously, they would drink horse's blood, right? So if you're out of food and you're out uh, on a military campaign, um, you could always make a little nick in your horse's uh, veins, drink the blood. It wouldn't kill the horse and, and you would be able to fight another day. So they were able to subsist just off of their animals, right? Um, they weren't opposed to having a little luxury now and then, right? And they would certainly trade with neighboring empires uh, for luxuries, technological improvements. And so they got iron tools, right? From interacting with the Chinese uh, tea, silk. And the Silk Road, right? The important trade routes tend to ran through Mongol territory. And the Silk Road will play an important role in the later Mongol Empire. It is sort of the economic engines of the Mongol Empire, these important trade routes uh, running from China all the way to the Middle East and Europe. So, being that these Silk Road ran through Mongol territory, they certainly had access to all of these uh, luxuries. And they, had, they weren't uh, ignorant of right, the rest of the world, uh, they certainly could. The nomad society was based on the tribe. The tribe was relatively small. It was based on family units. And, you know, it's about the size of a unit that could travel together from grazing area to grazing area as uh, as the seasons changed. The, the larger the group, the more people there would be. But these tribes were in contact with each other and alliances with other tribes was crucial to their success. Uh, there were a number of methods of creating these alliances. Marriage was one. So if your daughter marries someone from another tribe or vice versa, then those tribes become friendly um, and work together if there's a common enemy and so on. Another form of association was born brotherhood. So even if there was no blood relation, again, you know, family was sort of the core of this tribe. So if you wanted to join a tribe or join your two tribes together, you became sort of an artificial family, right? 
brotherhood. So a sworn oath could make you effectively a brother. Um, there were also sort of client relationships between smaller tribes and more powerful tribes. So you could sort of submit to another tribe and uh, in return, right, get some protection from that larger, more powerful tribe. And take all those processes of association, repeat, 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 and you can get fairly large confederacies of tribes, right? And that's essentially how the Mongol Empire All of the, the leaders of these Mongol empires will be called Khan. Um, the term comes from the Turkish, uh, and it implies a sort of mandate from the gods. So it is a sort of a, a religious term to denote right, the gods. Sort of, the Mongols were a polytheistic people, so when we mean the gods, it's literally. Uh, the method of picking the Khan was sort of unique to Mongol society. So it wasn't a strictly patrilineal sort of situation. So a Khan dies, it doesn't mean that automatically the, el the eldest son becomes Khan. Uh, instead, uh, they wanted to choose the best leader and it wasn't sort of a democratically a democratic process, but you know, there's a limited uh, list of candidates, right? Including uh, the Khan's sons and maybe brothers, and other close relatives. Then there would be a series of fights, negotiations, even assassinations, right? All sorts of maneuvering. Um, and that sort of maneuvering was essential to the process because it sort of revealed who would be the best leader, right? Who was going to be the most aggressive, the most clever, the most ruthless. And after that period, after that process continues for some period, then a committee would choose. Um, it was a the, their sort of most, uh, you had to pick a top deity, right? So Zeus of their, of, who was Zeus to the Greeks, right? It was the father of all the gods, the head of all the gods. For the Mongols was Tengri. Uh, and again, my presentation came out uh, early, a lot of this stuff. Um, not the only deity, but it was kind of the, the greatest one. You also had shamans in, in the Mongol, I think later in lies with a picture of a, more contemporary Mongol shaman, uh, but they were like priests uh, who could intercede with the gods and on behalf of the Khans would be in sort of the, the inner circle of the, of the leader right? as a priest or a religious uh, means of contact with the gods. So various confederacies of tribes would dominate area times and, and the more powerful they were, the more they could profit off of the Silk Road. Uh, so again, yeah, Turkish tribes gave us the term Khan and these Turkish tribes kind of dominated the area during the, the Sui and Tang dynasties of China. So this is about 581 to 900 AD. Um, later, the Uyghurs, uh, sort of cooperated with the Tang Dynasty and, and gained prominence there. Um, they were hired as soldiers, right? So the Chinese would, again, the Mongols were imposing uh, warriors, and so they were often hired as, as uh, hire uh, for the various Chinese kingdoms that might be fighting each other. And so that could make you rich. And so the Uyghurs prospered for a while. Um, Later, the Song dynasty, Song dynasty allied with the Khitans road. So again, different confederacies of Mongol tribes would dominate at different times, often as a result of their alliance with the dominant Chinese dynasty. Uh, Genghis Khan's ancestors came from the north and they were pushing against the Khitans, who were the dominant force at the time around the early 1000s, they started, right? Chinggis Khan's tribe started to emerge as a force around the 1000s, okay. Um, yeah, around 1000 AD. Um, so, Chinggis Khan eventually became sort of the head, right? The Khan of the, the most dominant uh, group at the time, 
Uh, we'll see more in a moment, a little bit more about his biography. Um, but his military system, right, of, of leading that tribe, that confederation of tribes, uh, it, he adopted and improved a traditional system, which is the decimal system of military units. So you had units of 10 men that would then be combined into units of 100 and then 1,000 and so on. Uh, one of his strategies is one that we've seen over and over in empires to mantle the traditional tribal units, right? So you have, you know, you come to be leader and there were still have competitors, right? There's families that were also prominent that were hoping that their sons or, you know, some member of their family would have become Khan. And so you are immediately have all these competing and powerful enemies within the tribe. And so something has to be done with them. And often what we see is we dismantle that traditional aristocratic system, scramble it all up, make it a meritocratic system, or at least right change the boundaries uh, away from that traditional hierarchy. And that's exactly what uh, Genghis Khan does as well. Reassembles people in the units that are to be loyal to their unit and to the Khan and not to their own particular family. Uh, each soldier was made responsible for all the others in his unit. So if one soldier performs poorly, everyone gets punished. And this was a mechanism for keeping everyone. Uh, so training in mountain warfare happens from a young age. Here is a, this is a contemporary, right, Mongolian little girl of about three or four. Looks like maybe a little older. With her bow and arrow on a horse right? from as soon as you were able to sit on a horse you were, you're riding and, and learning uh, learning to hunt and uh, to, uh, right, to fire to use bow and arrow and so on so they had this there was a famous uh, mongol warriors had which is ride in one direction and turn and shoot right in the other direction with the bow and arrow uh, so yeah i think i said very good back there are also sort of more uh, tactics that were sort of more large-scale that Mongols were also excellent at right which um, prominent among them was the fake retreat so again the whole the Mongols often couldn't you know a single tribe especially a tribe could not necessarily take down a Chinese army in sort of head combat what they instead needed to do was draw the enemy out, right? And then slaughter them while they were in, uh, not in formation, right? So you accomplish that with deception, right? So you make it look like you're retreating and then the enemy thinks, oh, it's a rout, right? We, we've beaten them, now we need to just chase them down and, and, uh, and decimate them. And so the, you draw them out with a fake retreat and then you turn around, reassemble very quickly and able to uh, to catch them off guard the mongol uh, strategy uh, they use the compound bow as their primary weapon uh, which is composed of materials right making it more, more powerful and uh, they but they also use gunpowder right whatever you know they were open to whatever technology they could find and they certainly had access to it I mean, one important, very important part of their effectiveness as a military force is that they didn't have to worry about supply lines. They didn't have to worry that the soldiers were thinking of their farm at home, right, not being tended to, and their wives and their families. They were nomadic people, right? So if the campaign progressed from area to area, you brought your wife and your children and your herd with you. Warfare was just the way of life, right? Life was a military. Um, that campaign was your home, and there was no need for supply lines. You had everything you needed to live right, right there with your herd, and you know, quite some horse blood if you're in a pen. So they could be at war all the time. You didn't need to need to um, go home and sort of like get things in order. Okay, so a little, little more about you. You know, we haven't always focused on the personality of a particular ruler. You'll notice we didn't say a lot about Julius Caesar and so on. But Chinggis Khan merit, merits at least one slide to himself. Very interesting guy. So his, his biography 
supports this sort of traditional nomadic notion that Han needs to be chosen by the god, right? And in Genghis's case, it's because his rise to power seems so improbable, right? The gods must have been involved. They must have picked him early on and made sure that he succeeded in this improbable way. Uh, so he was born to Mujin in a relatively unremarkable family. And then at a young age, his father was killed. His tribe deserted him. And it was simply him and his mother foraging for food, eating and drinking, right? Um, completely destitute, probably destined for death very soon, right? Um, but earlier on, he had married, right? And he had received a dowry when he married his wife. And so he used that little bit of money that he had to sort of buy his way into a tribe, right? Into the good graces of a clan leader. And he began to serve uh, that leader and rose in the ranks just due to his own importance. Right? So he becomes, right, sort of the, the first stage of him revealing, right, who he would become is when his wife is kidnapped by another tribe. Uh, so he hunts this tribe down, defeats them, right, mercil mercilessly slaughters them, gets his wife back, and sort of this story of his revenge, right, and his ruthlessness sort of cements his reputation, and writing on that reputation becomes the chief of his tribe. He then rises, he's later elected upon of a large confederation of tribes, uh, then did not go after the Chinese straight away, right? that would be a bad idea. Instead, he allies with the Chinese Jin dynasty in order to, to fight competing tribes and to cement right, his status as the biggest name right in Mongols, among the Mongols. So he definitely made use of these strategic Streets, right? Lots of clever field tactics, obviously a very good military mind. Um, eventually, he becomes Khan of all the people of the steppe. He changes his name to Chinggis Khan. In 1206, we have a right, more or less united Mongol uh, tribes right, with Chinggis Khan. Again, as we said, right, he broke up the traditional nobility, these blood-based relations, these loyalties to anyone but him. Uh, he had to come down on those hard. So um, not only reorganizing the military, also murder, assassination, even of his own relatives, if he suspected his relatives of being of divided loyalties, right? The only loyalty had to be personal loyalty to him. And then in return, right, to, again, to cultivate this feeling of um, loyalty, he sort of had a, a man of the people image, right? So wear relatively common clothes, he would eat the common food, um, and cultivated, right, this relationship of everyone is personally loyal and personally uh, beholden. So he had pretty much risen as far as he could among the Mongols, right, he was the leader of the, uh, of the Mongols, and so now he's starting to look to expand this is where the empire starts to become an empire. So with the tribes unified and his rule over the Mongols uh, consolidated, right? Genghis Khan was looking for other places to expand and China was the obvious target, right? It's a very nearby, very rich empire. And as we've seen, it's always sort of on the verge of fragmenting into separate kingdoms. So at the time, the Song Dynasty was dominating in the south and then the Jin were in the north. But being the strategist that he was, Khan uh, did not take on China just yet, right? Not until he was well prepared. So he was still subduing some problem areas. There were some rebellious tribes up in Siberia and elsewhere. So once that was all settled, he didn't have to worry about uh, any people on the other side of his empire. He moved on the Jin. And conquered their capital, which is near modern Beijing in 1215. So you can see that's sort of in the northern area. There. So again, he stopped and didn't immediately move on the song. And in fact, he uh, wasn't able to move on the song in his lifetime. Uh, but he paused and again sought to consolidate his empire and 
in particular to make sure that trade routes, right, to the road that ran through the territory was secure and that um, he could make money off of it, right? So um, he sent a messenger to the, of Iran at the time to try to form an alliance with Iran, right, uh, to help strengthen his position. Uh, but the Shah had the Mongol emissaries killed, which was bad news for that Shah, right, because Genghis Khan being Genghis Khan immediately retaliated, right, and invaded Central Asia instead. And so if the Mongols conquered you, that was bad news for you. They basically leveled it, right? All the men were killed, women and children were taken as slaves, and anyone they thought be, might be useful, uh, clergymen, again, they were polytheistic, so clergymen of any kind was useful to them. Uh, if you were an artisan with some particular skill, you were kidnapped, sent back to the Mongol Empire uh, so that you could be used to them. So before he could move on and finish his conquest of the Chinese Empire, as Chinggis Khan did, it was a relatively minor, minor battle. So he was always in there in the, in the fray, right? And the risk of that is he was killed. So he did get killed in 1224. So there was a lot of warfare going on, but it actually enabled um, an era of relative peace, a lot of trade, and a lot of prosperity for the Mongols and for anyone that was engaged in trade with the Mongols. Uh, so much of the conquest that was going on was meant to protect the trade routes that were the primary source of the empire's wealth. Uh, and so sort of paradoxically, all this war enabled right, the, the source of the peace. So Genghis Khan died, but he had already worked out a plan for his succession. The title of Khan went to his third son, but his other sons received other territories um, in various areas of the empire. And these sons immediately set to work and the empire conquered their neighbors in Europe, Central Asia. And under his successor, uh, his grandson, Kublai Khan, uh, who you may, may also be a familiar name to you, uh, the Song Dynasty in the South was finally, in China was finally uh, completed, was finally conquered. And you can see here in this uh, GIF here, the expansion of the Mongol Empire um, to uh, become the largest empire in history. Last, another grandson pushed into Eastern Europe and Central Asia, uh, conquering Baghdad. So um, at the end of it, by the middle of the 1200s, in an incredibly fast pace, right? Remember this ends in uh, the beginning of the 1200s. Uh, we have the Mongol Empire dominating, right? So it wasn't just warfare that allowed for the prosperity and of the Mongols. Uh, they were skilled at diplomacy as well. So if you were sort of in the sights of Mongolian expansion, uh, being having your city level was not the only option, right? Um, your other option would be to surrender and to cooperate with the, the Mongols. And this could be a, a quite lucrative, rewarding strategy. And, and the Armenians chose that path. The Rus, who were the ancestors of the Russians, right, um, chose that path as well. Uh, and you could, you know, become sort of a protectorate of the Mongol Empire. They would often, you know, use some of the, if you were sort of a rich person or an influential person, and you surrendered, you could remain a rich and influential person just in service of the Mongols instead. So, uh, lots of people chose this path instead of being murdered. Um, so eventually the descendants of Chinggis Khan formed sort of four distinct dynasties. Right? You have the Golden Horde and sort of the Northwest. And the other Khanates, right, in sort of the Middle East, one in sort of Central Asia, and then one basically of China. Um, so by about 1260, there's not really a single Mongol Empire anymore, or like four Mongol empires, plural. So this transition from nomadic warriors, right, who being nomadic warriors were very successful at expansion. Um, transition from that situation into now governing a large empire was not the most natural one. So uh, one of the great cons is quoted as saying, the empire was created on horseback, but it would not be governed on horseback. So now you have 
got the largest empire in history, uh, you're going to need some help, right? You're going to need some intermediaries. This is the case with all the empires we've looked at. Uh, it's also going to require some flexibility, different styles of government in different areas. So, um, in China, Kublai Khan declared himself emperor in 1272, and he adopted the title Yuan, uh, which means roughly origin of the cosmos. This was a deliberate choice, right? So it sort of obscures the, his four origins, that he's Chinese. Um, it sort of also connects him to the mandate of heaven, right? Which was supposed to be uh, what the, em the Chinese emperors had. Having his origin in heaven, right? He's sort of saying, okay, I can be a Chinese emperor, emperor, well, emperor, well. Um, so you're governing this huge empire, taxes need to be collected and you need information about who's in your empire and what sort of taxes they owe. So you need a lot of demographic information and a huge census was under in 1252. Uh, we've seen similar things going on right in the Roman empire. They, about a thousand years earlier, they had to do a lot of census taking in place. So they divided the population according to the same system as the military, this decimal system, right? Of groups of hundreds, groups of thousands, and then this mapped on to your military service. So uh, everyone in the empire required to serve in the military as well. Uh, the taxation system was varied. So for nomadic peoples, their herds were taxed, land owning agricultural people, right? The land was taxed, people were taxed, slaves, and uh, Depending on the area, often the taxes were progressive. The wealthy people were taxed at a higher rate than less wealthy people. So taxation in particular requires intermediaries. You need tax collectors, right? Again, we don't have a sort of digital system where you can just file your taxes online and, and right, send, uh, send a bank transfer. You need someone out there collecting all this currency and making sure that people pay even when um, obvious that uh, anyone's around to uh you need a you need a person around to say hey give me your taxes right we aren't going to do it voluntarily um but the more intermediary intermediaries you use as we've seen there's always the danger of fragmentation right as they gain more power they're going to want to maybe set up shop for themselves and not have to send the tributes back right, to the con so the Mongols were as paranoid about this as any empire would be, uh, particularly the Chinese. And they addressed this issue in part by excluding non-Mongols from the military. So uh, but people could become officials, right? But they wouldn't be trained in combat. So effectively, right, the Khan was trying to monopolize organized violence. And so only Mongols uh, can do this. and hopefully to stave off the idea that some uh, foreign official or intermediary would also put together a, a good sized army or an effective army and then attempt to break off the body, including them from the army. Uh, officials were often also shuffled or relocated, right? So um, we saw the Islamic forces doing this as well. And again, the aim is to break their any local loyalties, them developing in a particular place, they kidnap you, train you, station you somewhere else where you don't really have any connections or family. Uh, you look like you're getting too powerful, we'll move you somewhere else, right? Um, but the strategies varied according to the area. So the Chinese were excluded from government service entirely, right? Uh, again, they would have been very paranoid, right, about the Chinese. Uh, they were their most powerful enemy, and so. The fact that they were excluded from government service may have explained the flourishing of Chinese art and literature during this period. They weren't able to do occupation. Uh, they focused on art. So the Mongols were largely indifferent to religion. This we've seen as really a lot of polytheistic empires. Uh, they're also remember the history was largely tribal. Each tribe might have different gods and the tribes often intermarried, formed different alliances, so they had to be pretty open to other people. Not something we're going to be totally isolated. Um, this picture is of a, of a Mongol shaman more, more recently. Um, and a, a Mongol leader would happily convert to some other religion if it was convenient, right? So if he's in 
Christian territory and they want him to convert to Christianity, he'll do it. It was had a different meaning, right, for a Mongol, for a polytheistic Mongol, right, to convert to Christianity would often not be that there was only one God. It was sort of assumed, like, oh, yeah, I'll tell you, that's other God. Um, the most influential conversion was to Islam, and a good proportion of the Mongols uh, did convert to Islam, and that became the majority in, in the late 1400s. So as loose as this Mongol rule could sometimes seem, coming from this sort of tribal background, there was a, a specific code of laws it was designed by Chinggis Khan. Unfortunately, we don't have that code anymore. It's sort of been lost to history, or maybe something will be discovered one day, but we lack a lot of the details of the legal system, unfortunately. Um, but we do know that uh, significant leeway was given to localities to this according to their own customs. Uh, you may recall a similar point in Rome, right, where the Romans were covered by Roman law, but if you happen to be somewhere in Gaul, um, you know, among Gallic peoples could be killed according to their own law. A similar system was adopted by the Mongols in the far-flung areas of their empire. Um, trade routes, trade routes is sort of the core of the Mongol Empire, um, and they developed some strategies for that. So they had stations uh, every 25 to 30 miles in a day on a horse. Um, each of these stations uh, held like horses, supplies, they served as communication stations, taxation, right? Um, and in order to sort of access these services and check in, you needed a passport, which is this medallion that was inscribed. So this whole system of stations was called the dam and coordinated the flow of goods and the flow of information throughout the empire and is a fairly sophisticated method of sort of monitoring and uh, allowing trade to flow. So all this trade, right, vastly changed the lifestyles of these people, right? So, you know, these Mongols weren't drinking horse blood anymore. Um, they had wheat bread, right? Again, for non-agricultural people, wheat bread would be a sort of thing, right? A luxury, pasta, almonds, pistachios, all, all the fruits of this far-flung empire that connects, you know, other empires and, and states beyond its borders through trade. Uh, you have a lot of flow through, and the Mongols certainly uh, afforded themselves of those. Um, arts and sciences also flourished under Mongol rule. You don't necessarily think of, right, the Genghis Khan as a scientist, but medicine, map making, astronomy, right, all developed in the Mongol Empire, uh, architecture, illustration, calligraphy, uh, carpet making, which was a very traditional art, um, developed also under the Mongol Empire. Here's an example of a sort of Mongol uh, carpet painting. So all of this was made possible by the fact that trade was so central to the Mongols. As you'll recall that the Chinese sort of looked down on merchants, and, uh, right? That an emperor was sort of disparaged for being descended from a merchant, right? Um, they didn't have any of that prejudice. They just enjoyed all the benefits of trade and all the benefits of flowing through their empire. Uh, they also began a history of the world, right? Again, they were able to collect manuscripts from all over the empire and began to compile them into uh, a history. So, you know, we said it was a relatively short lived empire. We should spend a little time talking about the reasons for that. So, Part of the military advantage of the Mongols came from their nomadic background. They were very, right, forced warriors. Uh, but as they became settled, right, and they began to enjoy, you know, wheat bread, right, for example, um, they lost the advantage of this mobility. And fragment, fragmentation started to become attractive to the local leaders, right, as a, as a method of gaining some power in addition to conquest conquest of new territories. So we already saw that sort of the Genghis Khan's original empire had broken up into four large khanates by the 1300s, and those began to fall sort of one by one. The Ilkhans in the Near East, uh, from the Mamluks of 
Mamluks of Egypt um, and also the Mongols of the Golden Horde, uh, sort of some dynastic succession battles in China. They were under some other Mongol tribes in the north, in the south, there were peasant rebellions. Um, so eventually, these Chinese territories returned to Chinese rule, right? And we had the later Chinese dynasty collapsing into the 1900s, right? Um, the Golden Horde, which was the Khanate in what is now Russia, broke up into internal competition, and the other Central Asian Khanates also broke up. So eventually, fragmentation of labor, the, the familiar story we see with uh, many of these empires, particularly the ones in the, in the area of China. Uh, there was a resurge of a Mongol Empire under Tamerlane, right? He managed to revive a large portion of the Mongol Empire. Um, and he, he pushed again back as far as Baghdad and India uh, in 1405 in, a, in an attempt to reconquer China. Uh, he was succeeded by his son, but that dynasty didn't last much longer. That was largely sort of like driven by his personality uh, and he, his character not being as charismatic and, and was not really able to keep it together. So we're at 41 minutes. I'll, I'll end there, right? Um, but uh, I will check in Monday and we're, I'm just going to be talking about your paper and how to write your paper. And then there's a holiday after that. So next week is a relatively um, week lecture wise, um, but do pay attention to that. Uh, the lecture I'm going to give on how to write a term paper. It is important to understand what you're going to do. All right, next time.